is the analysis that you need to do and choose the right reasons to leave. It is not necessary that if you get overlooked that you have to leave. However, if you feel that uh, by leaving you can, you know, you can have a better quality of life. By quality of life does not necessarily only mean more money. Uh, when I come to the financial part, I'll talk about uh, how I calculated and what I did uh, as far as that is concerned. But it also means a little bit of stability, the the opportunity to st stay with your family and spend time with your family, and also to pursue things that you like. You know, like uh, three idiots, you're pursuing, pursuing your passion. It sounds very romantic. Uh, you're lucky if you can get it to work. It took me a while. But fortunately, I was able to make it work to some extent. OK, so analyze your priorities. And so the advice would be the sooner you do the, that analysis and the sooner you arrive at that decision, the better it is, because it will give you more time to prepare. Now, coming to the preparation. So the planning and preparation, uh, I'll share what, what all planning and preparation I did. And uh, so that may be able to guide you as to what, what you can think of doing various things. So the first and the most important part was the financial plan. Uh, in a rough ballpark kind of uh, a calculation, I came to realize that purely in financial terms, if I continue to serve beyond 20 years, uh, more or less financially, it's not making any difference to me for the simple reason that the returns that I would get from my retirement corpus plus my pension would equal my carry home pay or would surpass its life. And so whatever I do to earn would be over and above that. Of course, you know, you don't get the other facilities like the accommodation and all that, but that I had catered. So I did a detailed financial planning and what helped me was that since I was posted in Delhi for three years and uh, out of those three years, one and a half years, I was living out in HRA and uh, while doing that, the only support I had from uh, the army was a buddy who used to come once a day for two hours. So I realized that if I can survive in this much living outside while in service, I, it gave me that confidence that yes, I can, you know, this is how much I will need to survive. The other uh, advantage that I had was that, uh, or in fact, we worked towards it as a team, was uh, that once we came to Delhi, uh, my wife picked up a job. Initially, she was teaching in a school. And then uh, you know, we planned for her to move into the corporate sector for uh, so that you know that basic tactics uh, i'm from armored corps but the basic infantry tactics and the, it actually remains the same for armored corps as well of one foot on the ground so there was a transition period where uh, you know uh, my earnings was restricted to my pension at, at that point of time you know having a second salary coming in was very helpful so uh, that was very helpful the other thing that i did was that uh, uh, I vacated the government accommodation about a year before I actually moved out of the army. Uh, that helped me, you know, uh, settle down better. It, it helped me ease out the transition. And uh, it also kind of cut off those, you know, those, uh, uh, the, what would I say, the, the longing for, you know, the, 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 amenities that the service provides and help me adapt to the civilian environment. So that is one uh, preparation I did. <coughs> as far as the financial planning is concerned, uh, we worked out based on what are expenses and uh, short term expenses, periodic expenses. By periodic expenses, I meant, I mean that, OK, uh, so coming going forward, say every five years, I want to change my car. Uh, the car, uh, apart from the running expense, what is going to be the annual expense? Uh, children's, uh, my son was in class 8th when I left. Uh, he, 
he's going to pass out going to college so some amount of money say four years from now i'm going to need at least this much so that kind of planning i did and what really helped me was i got hold of a professional financial plan uh, and uh, he was the guy who did all this planning for me and i came to a figure that okay if i have this much in a month uh, as a household income we are good to go and this i did before uh, i actually quit so with that kind of a clarity uh, it helped me a great deal that i said okay if i get even minimum this much is good anything i get over and above that is of course you know icing on the cake so that and my focus was on quality of life my bottom line was that by leaving my quality of life should not come down in any manner it should only go up so those are the rough parameters on which you know i based my planning then came the biggest challenge which i am sure uh, a lot of you are also struggling with and if some of you have managed to narrow it down i am sure you are very lucky which what was what am i going to do i knew i was confident that uh, there are a lot of things that i can do all of us are you know by by the fact that we have cleared upsc and we have gone, undergone the academy training and then thereafter we have served in this elite organization it gives us firstly it that that filter is there so we are we are a cut above the rest and it the the, the learnings that we have got the discipline that we have got uh, gives us a tremendous advantage so leveraging that i knew that there was there were a lot of things that i could do the point was what did i want to do and i faced the same problem that you may be facing right now is about limited knowledge about what all is out there so uh, again the delhi tenure helped i interacted with a lot of people and i you know found out a little more and i spent a lot of time reading i, I am fond of reading and i i exercised that hobby and i read a lot and i came to two three conclusions firstly i said before i identify what i want to do let me exclude what i don't want to do so the areas that i decided that i do not want to get into were security administration and uh, you know representing defense industry for no other reason but because i mean i'm not saying that uh, these are not sectors that you should not get into or they are anything it was just a personal choice these are the area that i identified that i felt that i don't want to get into these particular areas especially uh, the last one because i had got a very good offer from one of the uh, large aircraft uh, helicopter conglomerates since uh, you know before i left i was in mo9 mo9 uh, is involved in validating gsq arts so i was dealing very closely with the equipment uh, and i was also and you know uh, with the formulation of the 11th five year plan was on at that time so with that kind of experience i had a lot of knowledge about the procurement and the uh, thing but i deliberately chose not to go into that area although it was very well paying for two reasons one was having been on the other side of the fence i realized it's a it's a very difficult game to be on on the selling side uh, and i also realized that there is a little bit of hesitancy in amongst serving officers so what what would it entail it would entail me reaching out to people posted in we pp and trying to make presentations to them nothing nothing underhand nothing illegal is not as if one is trying to bribe someone but yet there is a little bit of hesitancy amongst Uh, it, it was there when i was on the other side of the fence also to interact with people who have something to sell to the forces so i said why do i i don't want to be in that situation where someone is hesitant to meet me when i call up a postmate or i call up a colleague and he tries to avoid meeting me so those are the reasons i had for not joining that particular field despite the fact that i had a lucrative offer okay so having eliminated these i did a swot analysis i am sure uh, all of you know what is a swot analysis uh, in case any of you doesn't it means strength weakness opportunities and threats 
So uh, I would suggest that read up a little bit about SWOT analysis and uh, do your own SWOT analysis, do an honest SWOT analysis to maybe narrow down the domains that you want to get into. Having done my SWOT analysis, I came to the conclusion that I want to get into knowledge domain. That was the broad domain I identified. And when I, having identified that domain, I uh, narrowed down further and said that within this domain, what are the job opportunities or what are the employment avenues? I came down to learning and development, which is uh, training in a very simple way. Of course, training is one part of learning and development. Uh, I, uh, I mean, training is the delivery end of it, but there is a lot more to it. So I came on to learning and development, and I came on to communications specifically. I so I had thought my first choice was to get into uh, journalism, and second choice was to get into a multinational, you know, in a learning and development role. Uh, I started looking around for those kind of roles, and I realized that there was a challenge in that. There is an entry barrier because of the lack of relevant domain experience. So while I had 20 years of professional experience, I had zero years as far as journalism is concerned. I had no published work. I had nothing to show for it. And in terms of learning and development, I mean, one may have been an instructor, or but that, that really doesn't count. So I would I did not want to get into uh, into one of these slots at a level below what I I would feel comfortable with it. So I chose the other option of going on it on my own. And how I did that was I said the best thing to do is there are two things to do. One is to gain experience and to build credibility. And to do that in terms of uh, you know you can call it journalism i started my own blog and i started posting it i start i started posting my articles on that uh, started promoting it very vigorously shamelessly sending the links to every possible thing i knew trying to get more visibility uh, and in terms of uh, learning and development i started off uh, freelancing for it uh, entrepreneurship was also an option, and uh, I, along with another officer who was six months senior to me, uh, we started a company and we started delivering trainings through that company. We started delivering corporate trainings through that company. Uh, six months down the line, I had my hands burned because uh, I had walked into it without any kind of written you know understanding it was on a verbal agreement and you know good faith like a good foggy and uh, six months down the line i found myself kicked out uh, for no fault of mine but because that gentleman wanted to pick up a full-time job move out and wanted to retain the company and since the company was his on paper and i had no legal stakes in it i i had very little say in the matter but <clears throat> what I gained from that was experience and a uh, little bit of networking. And then I got into this. Uh, I, you know, I was very fortunate. It was Serendipity uh, International Finance Corporation, which is part of the World Bank Group. They were launching a new line of training in India. It was a whole new product, training product. And the place where my wife was working, they were closely associated with this project. And they were looking for someone to uh, bring this product into the country in, in terms of the operations and in terms of the delivery. So, uh, you know, having tasted this independence and freedom, I, I had these terms and conditions that I'm going to be a consultant. I'm not going to be a full-time employee. Uh, which has a lot of advantages because it gives you, uh, you know, your time is your own. If you're in a, if you're in a job, there are certain expectations that are there from you in terms of time commitment. Whereas if you are a consultant, the only expectation is in terms of delivery. 
whether you're working at night, whether you're working early morning or you're working in the afternoon, late evenings, it doesn't matter as long as you're delivering what you have contracted to deliver. So I got I got into that and I got picked up by IFC. I got set abroad for training and having got into the got in at the beginning of the program, I managed to rise quite quickly and I, I Presently, I am uh, so. I mean, I left that, but I continued to consult as an independent consultant with IFC, and have maintained that relationship for the past eleven years, and uh, that has helped me a lot in terms of networking, also in terms of getting a lot of assignments. During running that company or helping run that company, one thing I came to realize, in terms of whether it is as an entrepreneur or as a consultant, is that the most difficult part in entrepreneurship or freelancing is not the execution, but is in actually getting the projects or getting the assignments. It's, it's the sales part of the whole jing bank. And I realized that that was the most difficult part. And that is when I came to the, you know, when I saw this kind of, uh, when I had this experience with IFC, I realized that uh, I'm sure all of you or you must have heard of this Pareto's principle, which is that 80-20 rule, that 20% of your efforts give you 80% of your returns. So I decided to focus on those 20% of efforts to get 80% of the results. And uh, the rest of the 80% of my time, I focused in the other field that I had chosen, that was writing. So I selected these big clients like IFC, USAID, I enlisted with them and I used to take up assignments with them, which are more highly paid, higher paid than uh, which a normal, even a multinational would give you. And so with doing fewer assignments, I could get the same returns and that left me up with time to write. I graduated from writing a blog to writing a book. My first book was published in 2011, about a year and a half after I had left. And uh, that again helped me in establishing my credibility. And it also helped me in getting book writing projects. Now, those of you who are budding authors and who are, uh, you know, uh, who have that propensity to write, the issue with that is that there is no money in writing books. You don't get, you don't make money out of selling books unless you are a Chetan Bhagat or, you know, if you're when you reach that kind of level. But uh, the way that one can get paid for, for writing is by getting commissioned projects to write books. So I have written, uh, I have written seven books, out of which four were, which I was commissioned to write. What that means is that the organization hires you to write a book for them. You write the book and they pay you. And the sales and this thing is not your concern. So whether one copy sells or one lakh copy sells, it doesn't matter because you get paid upfront. And as a consultant, what I learned was how to calculate how much to charge for a particular assignment. And it is very simple. You calculate the amount of time that you're going to spend in that assignment and you calculate your per hour uh, cost and you multiply that. So these, uh, I got hired by Clause to write three books, which I did and I got money. I mean, I got paid much more than what uh, the sale of those books would have made. Similarly, then I got contracted by the Ministry of Defense for a project on history of First World War, uh, which again, you know, it gave me for two years, it gave me uh, monthly income, which was a good thing. And I could do this and then also eight, eight days, 10 days a month, I could do my trainings. I could even continue to work on the books while I was doing the trainings. So that worked out well. So that is a freelance kind of thing. Uh, now, in terms of another thing that helped me in terms of freelancing and uh, you know doing these kind of things and getting things done was setting a routine and giving a discipline in, into place. So, I mean, work from home has become a buzzword now for the last one and a half years, but I had been working from home for, uh, since 2010, I had been working from home. 20 days a month, I would be working from home, 10 days 
whenever I was on a training assignment, obviously I would travel, go, deliver the training, come back. But what helped me was to, I used to have office hours. Even although I was working from home, I would, I would treat my work day as I was, as if I was going to office, I would get up, go for my walk, get ready and sit on my table at about nine o'clock. So of course I did, you know, I carried on the good foggy habit of taking an afternoon nap. So I would work from about nine to one thirty, have my lunch, take a nap, then get back on my table, work again to six, six thirty. So otherwise it's very easy if you're working on your own and especially if you're freelancing and you, and especially when you don't have any ongoing assignment, it is very easy to lose track of time or, you know, while away time, watch TV, do, do unproductive work. So that is one discipline I had put in life, which is still standing me in good stead. And uh, being a Fauji, all of us, uh, it's very easy for us to put that discipline into place. So uh, learning and development, uh, I became an international master trainer. Uh, I've delivered training in many countries now. I've, I've trained a lot of trainers and it has been a very satisfying journey so far. Uh, last one year that has got converted online and I'm now delivering these programs online. Uh, I'll be sharing these details also with Manish. I think I've already shared them in the group once. Uh, I'm going to be doing this uh, train the trainer again uh, sometime next month I'll, I'll share those details in case any any anyone is interested a uh, couple of decision points i want to highlight one was about qualification uh, i had the option of doing the dgr iim course uh, but i chose not to do it and i did an analysis and i found that the if you have the order of priority or preference, the first priority would be a full-time MBA from a class A B school. That is one of the IIMs or IIFT or FMS, one of the XLRI. That is your, that would be a first priority. Second priority would be an executive program from any of these. Now, the disadvantage of the uh, uh, BGR program, uh, one was that the networking aspect was would be missing because my peers would be people who were like me and who were also looking at other opportunities. Whereas an executive program, when you're doing, your peers are people who are already working in the industry. They are relatively junior, five to seven years uh, work experience, but still it's a, it's a network that you and develop and you know you it's it's there for you and it is still standing me in good stead so i decided to join the iift uh, on campus executive program which was on weekends in fact if you go on to the reattire group that was advertised today only and i have posted it on the group there is an online option also and there is a face to face option also you can take a look at that so it is important to uh, you know do something like that but from if you do a part time mba from ignu or you know annamalai or something like that it's not really worth your time it's not going to add any value it is not going to uh, make any difference in your uh, cv <coughs> so that is as far as uh, my journey was concerned. Yeah, I missed out one point. Uh, that was uh, the other thing that I did. I think I mentioned it was uh, intellectual preparation, and that is extensive reading. I, I I used to read, and I had discovered ebooks at that point of time, and, and a lot of these sites where one could download free ebooks from. So I, I I really you know I voraciously consumed books on management, on self-help, on a lot of these related subjects, which helped me and are still helping me, uh, giving me a better perspective, uh, being able to, you know, engage with people. And uh, so anyway, so my one advice would be to read extensively. I will also share with you some recommended authors. I have written down, let me, I'll just find out pick up that slip and share with you. 
talk to as many people as you can especially in the cv street be curious that is the and you know with internet with youtube uh today the answer to every question is available you only need to know what questions to ask and the more you read the more you explore the more questions will come to your mind so that of course is uh, uh, the so i think i have covered my journey yeah so thereafter i i moved on apart from learning and development i also moved on to strategic consulting which is what i am also doing now with one of the big travel uh, tourism and aviation conglomerates in india which is the bird group and uh, strategic consulting is nothing but common sense it is something that all of us have learned uh, if you can write an appreciation writing a business plan is no different uh, only you know the terrain changes the enemy changes the factors change but the broad logic of creating a business plan remains the same as writing an appreciation for a situation so if you make that analogy and if you can make those correlations it is very easy for you to do something like strategic consulting as far as learning and development is concerned uh, all of us have experience in training our troops whether we have had a formal exposure as an instructor or not we have all trained uh, we have uh, delivered some kind of trainings that whether at unit level whether at uh, you know any higher levels pre staff all those things so that is something that we can do now the challenge is that there is we have not not been formally trained how to train that is why it is important to if you want to get into the learning and development field it is important to get a good insight into what all is the you know what all uh, forms the part of learning and development it starts with something called training needs analysis then you know you have setting up of learning objectives then identifying and creating content then the training part is actually delivering that content then doing your training impact assessment calculating the return on investment on training and then feeding this back into your content and refining the content so the uh, form all of us have the skills and the you know the the skill sets to get into learning and development we need to formalize them and adapt them for the corporate environment or like i am doing for the development environment development i mean this development space where international bodies are training people who are working in you know whether development of industry develop uh, development of enterprise development of energy sector so it's the same it's more or less the same it's basically adult learning we need to formalize what we know informally we need to formalize that so that is as far as uh, thing is concerned so now i come to the last part of my talk which is the lessons i have learned right so encapsulating what i said in the last 40 minutes or 32 minutes the lessons that i learned was firstly was about timely decision it was not a knee jerk reaction it was a well thought out decision it was a well planned decision with uh especially with the financial part planning part of it which is very important you know having done the financial planning i realized that i do not need to be in a desperate situation to get a job that i could spend time doing or building my credibility while earning much less than what was my earning potential with the knowledge that survival is not an issue and with the confidence that the work that i am putting in now in building my credibility and building my skills are going to pay back many fold uh, in a later time frame and that that worked out the third thing that i learned was rigidity in concept and flexibility in execution i'll say that again rigidity in concept and flexibility in execution so my concept was very rigid i decided where i am not going to go 
found the domain also came down to the realization not going to take up a 9 to 5 job so that concept was clear now how i executed it i was very flexible in that there were times when i while i had set a certain you know bar for myself that this is how much is going to be my daily uh, you know my hourly or my daily rate but there were times when i i accepted assignments at a much lower uh, remuneration because i looked at the total value of the assignment and when i say the total value of the assignment the monetary part is one component of the, the what you are getting as a compensation for that for doing or executing that assignment apart from that you are getting experience and you are getting a network and you are getting a visibility so if you calculate the these other components of an assignment and even if it then doesn't match up to the financial part of it it may still be worthwhile doing it today 11 years down the line i may not do that i may not go below the value of the monetary value that i have set but in that stage where in the beginning that is what i'm talking about flexibility in execution rigidity in concept flexibility in execution looking at the bigger picture looking at you know if i'm doing this today what can it lead to what are the avenues it is opening up for me that is another thing that i have learned and pareto principle like i said that uh, 80% of your returns come from 20% of your efforts right the trick is in identifying what is that 20% and focusing on that rather than running after the 80% which is going to give you the 20% returns now i'll give you an example of that to make it clearer i mentioned that i realized that marketing or selling if i was running my own training company uh 80% of my time would go in marketing or selling training which would give me leave me 20% of the time to do the training actually and that would give me that 20% of delivering the training was what would actually give me the returns whereas getting associated with an organization like IFC or US aid that uh, you know once you break through and once you are, once you once you are uh, empaneled with them then that 80% of marketing time gets taken away then they just give you they send assignments your way and your effort is that 20% in delivering them and that gives you the 80% of the results <coughs> so that is where the clarity also comes in other thing that i really learned and is something that comes to us inherently but we need to also do it consciously is deliver value there was in one of the books uh, there was a uh, one of the books by napoleon hill that i read that said you know those one of those laws for success was do more than you have been paid for and that is one thing that i think is very very useful doing more than what you have been paid for will always give you disproportionate returns a lot of us are used to saying you know ye mera kaam nahi ye g branch ka kaam hai ya q branch ka kaam hai but if someone asks you to do something which is beyond your charter which is beyond your thing if it is feasible if you can do it do it especially on in the cv street and especially in the formative stages it will give you returns delivering value over and above you know uh, when you 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 under promise and over deliver people will come back to you if you over promise and under deliver they will not come back to you so that is another thing that i have learned uh, the other thing i learned which i have covered but haven't given a name to is mentality of abundance a lot of us come from a space of desperation or scarcity trust me and i think manish also keeps harping about this when he talks about ctc and he talks about not accepting low offers it doesn't matter if you know if i've done my financial calculations and i said okay even a you know 1 lakh one or say 12 lakh or 18 lakh per annum job is good for me because i have my own house i am staying in this place and it doesn't matter you don't have to go for it 
just because that is what is the only thing available trust me i mean i was faced with that situation and i realized that by uh, you know i can accept that without accepting an employment i i i can tell them that look i'll work as a consultant with you on the same terms i'll give you the same deliverables i'm not your employee i am your consultant you pay me the same amount and let me do other things as long as your deliverables are delivered i am also free to do other things it's been working for me i'm i'm doing that right now also so that only can happen when you come from a mentality of abundance the other thing which is very very uh, important in the cv street is persistence and continuous follow up i'll give you an example i wanted i had uh, so one of the things that contributed to my decision to leave was reading a book called seven habits of highly effective people and it is in amongst the list of the recommended books that i have drawn up for you uh, guys having read that book and that, that having read that book and having implemented some of those uh, things i realized it it concretized my decision to leave it helped me prioritize my priorities in life and having done that i realized that i want to deliver this because i, I attended the training program also of that at, right in the beginning of uh, when i started off and i said that okay i i want to deliver this training since i want to get into the training field i want to deliver this training but i knew that at that point of time i did not have the credentials to approach them and tell them that i want to deliver your training there was a company called franklin kavi south asia which delivers these trainings so but four five years down the line having got enough training experience and having worked with ifc and a couple of other international uh, organizations i approached franklin kavi south asia i approached the md i said that this is madida my credentials i would like to deliver the seven habits program uh, i had a call with him he said colonel very good we are looking for people like you please join us i mean please not join us not as an employee but uh, start delivering programs for us i said fine that call happened and then i didn't hear back from them so what i did was every one month i used to send a mail to that gentleman saying that you know refer our previous discussion i'm looking forward to hearing back from you this carried on for one and a half years it was after one and a half years that they got back to me and i started delivering the training moral of the story is that it's not like in the army that you know once you once you written something or once you told something the onus is on them to come back to you no the onus is on you to follow up till it happens or till they tell you no because they will only you know reach out or they will only start looking for someone when they have that necessity if they do not have that necessity they will not reach out so one month or six months down the line they did not need someone because they had enough people at that point. but since i kept sending a mail every month the moment they had a need they came back to me so that is persistence is uh, one thing and so that is the things that i have learned two things that you know the the black demos or things that uh, uh, you know what pitfalls to avoid was like i told you i had a bad experience when i set up the company and that was because i went on trust alone that is not to say that do not trust others but have everything in writing especially if you are going in for entrepreneurship you are starting a company in partnership with someone please have a clear understanding you may have a very good verbal understanding but do not hesitate to put it down on paper and have it as uh, as a official document it's not that you're not trusting that other person or he's not trusting you but it helps in the long run it's it's very and it's very clear to have an exit plan also that okay we are starting this together now tomorrow if i have to leave or if you have to leave what is the exit plan so that is one of the key learnings i have had as far as uh, you know uh, these the, from the bad experiences that i have and uh, by the grace of god that is the only bad experience i had rest of all my experiences have been good and i'm very grateful to god for that and i'm very grateful for to the organization which has sustained me nurtured me for 20 years or 24 24 years if you count the academy training which has enabled me to realize my dreams 
so gentlemen that is i don't, I don't know if there any lady officers here also ladies and gentlemen that is all i have uh, from my side uh, just give me a second my i had made a slip it has flown away there are some recommended reading that I had thought of, and I would urge you, those of you who are in the process of leaving, please read extensively. A couple of books is one is like I told you, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. This is a must read. Then there was another. Uh, this is by Stephen Covey. I'm sure all of you, most of you, must have already read it or would have heard of it. Uh, the other book is called The Four Hour Work Week. The Four Hour Work Week by a gentleman called Timothy Ferris. The third is, again, it's an old one. All of us have heard of it. I don't know how many of us have read it. I read it only when I was preparing to leave. That is How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. These are very basic stuff, but uh, common sense stuff, but it helps you. And fourth one was a book called 16 Laws of Success by Napoleon Hill. These four books. I would strongly recommend all those who, of you who are preparing to leave, read them, uh, understand them, and uh, see where, wherever it is applicable, please apply. Uh, some other authors that I would recommend, one is Peter Drucker. He's a well-known management guru who passed away recently. Brian Tracy, uh, Anthony Robbins, and Wayne Dyer. So I'll, I'll, uh, maybe I'll put this list in the group. So these are some of the recommended, and this is, uh, that doesn't mean you need to restrict your reading to these. These are some I found useful, so I thought I'll share. So that is all from my side, and now I'm open to questions. Uh, thank you, sir. Rohit, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, while we start with the questions and people warm up to the questions, so guys, uh, first take up the poll again. I think so far, I must tell you the poll results, sir. The results, uh, the people who have uh, voted so far, not all yet. About 2018, 21 of them have voted, 38%, that is 8 of them are still with 2 years left, 28% will retire in about one year, within 1 year, and 33% are retired. So it's a fair mix, 66% uh, almost of the pre-retirees and 33% retired people, right sir? Okay, so, so I think these are applicable, what yeah. I have said is applicable to uh, little more yeah. to the people who have have, uh, who have yet to leave, but uh, also to the people who have left, I'm sure. Yes, sir. So that's the uh, basic universality principle that good things apply to everyone, actually, irrespective of which you are part of uh, flock you belong to. So having said this, sir, uh, I must uh, also acknowledge that uh, Chetan Bhagat's wonderful book, The Three Big Mistakes of My Life. So as far as this webinar is concerned, the two mistakes I made, first one was misspelling your name with two D, two G's in Agarwal's your surname. And second one was to say that you've written six books because I had only six names. I heard you said you've written seven books. So. Okay, actually, you know, there is a there is a little bit of dichotomy in that. The figure is between six and nine. Because okay. there is one, I'll, I'll tell you why. One is that there is a translation. So I don't know whether to count it as one book or two books because there is a book on 65 war which has been translated into Hindi. So when I want to, you know, when I want to exaggerate, I count that as two books. So I've written it only once and someone else has translated it. And there is, like I said, when I was spending a lot of time and I said I have to sit on my table and do something, I compiled a joke book. Um, wait, I'll just show it to you. It is a huge work. Yeah, looks like. Right. So this, I don't know, in a serious forum, I don't count this as a book. But this has got 10,000 jokes compiled from the internet. Okay, okay, it, okay. it does well, it sells well on Amazon and you know, especially the ebook version sells. So sometimes okay. I count this book, sometimes I don't. Wonderful. It's, it still takes effort. I, if, if we go in terms of everything uh, reduced to time and space, I think it takes time. So it's an effort, uh, whether it is somebody's or else, it doesn't matter, original or otherwise. Having said this, so these are the two, big, two small mistakes. And the third big mistake which I made is I have been I have known you for so long, but haven't discussed many things which you spoke today. So I am glad that I was part of this webinar today. And now, uh, before let me just see whether somebody is yeah some people have posted some questions. The question comes from Vignesh. He says, uh, "Can you help me how to become a corporate trainer 
and certification that will help to acquire knowledge and skill. Right. Uh, Vignesh, okay. Uh, let me take two minutes and give you the landscape of corporate training. Now, there are, if you look at most major multinationals who would be your clients, they have global tie ups for training. They have a large internal LD practice where they have their own. So, where the trainings that they do frequently, they have their own people trained and certified and they deliver them. Uh, for others, they have international. So, when you want to be a uh, corporate trainer, uh, the, so this is one part of the thing. The second part is there are a couple of these global companies which have these co uh, contracts globally with the multinationals, like Franklin Covey, for which I was I was telling you about training. And third, are there is a bunch of uh, you know the the corporate trainers, the freelance or the small companies, primarily are of people who are. Formerly, who have been in HR in a multinational or in a big company for 15, 20 years and then left that and started corporate training. So the challenge in being a corporate training is not the certification, is not the acquiring the knowledge and skill. It is in getting the business. Okay. Now, the path to becoming a corporate trainer, one is that you can either join one of these big organizations. Like I told you, I told, gave you my story about Franklin Covey. Um, I, I persisted, I joined, I started delivering. And uh, so if you join with one of these big companies, you, you are not, you, uh, you do not have the challenge of spending 80% of your time selling the training. They sell the training, you go and deliver. The second path is if you do want to get out on your own and you have a good network where you can go and sell, I would suggest pick up a niche, pick up a good topic. Leadership training, soft skills training is not, it, there are a dime a dozen, there are a lot of people and especially these XHR people who have, they have the ability, network to be able to sell, right? If you're going to train on communication skills, if you're going to train on uh, leadership, uh, it's it's very iffy. So as far as uh, this thing is concerned, uh, either you have a good network, identify a good niche. I'll give you some examples of a good niche: change management. Right. Uh, again, like I said, be curious, look around, talk to people, see what are what is uh, what is it that people are looking for, and go into a niche area. Gain expertise on that, build credibility on that, and then take a certification on that. Now, as far as certification is concerned, uh, again, now I'm, it's not that I'm selling my uh, training, but I the, the organization that uh, I've been working for, IFC, it does give a training certification, which is certified by, again, another international body called Learning and Performance Institute, which is a UK-based body. Uh, that is one certification that you can uh, acquire. And if you're interested, you can contact me and I'll guide you how to do that. It is important to get a certificate. If you join a big company like Franklin Covey or something, and you can join them as a consultant, but only when you're uh, training that you, uh, you know, you're on their roles. Otherwise, your time is your own. Then they train you. So if you join Dale Carnegie, if you join Franklin Covey or any of these big companies, they will train you and they will certify you and then you deliver on their behalf. Other is that you get these certifications like uh, what I'm talking about. When you get a certification from IFC, then IFC and these all these USA, uh, Jerry Blair Foundation, all these agencies, they keep posting. They have a consultant uh, portal. They keep posting assignments on that. You can go there, you can apply, and you can. So that selling part of it gets cut out. And uh, for I know there is time is limited now, but you can, again, for any further questions and all, please feel free. Uh, I'm on the group. Just, or you can no, no, we have got time. We have got time till eight thirty, sir. We have got time till right, eight thirty. Right. So, any any further specific question that you have, uh, while I tackle the next question, you can think of any yeah. other. Yeah. So the next question is: uh, This is from someone who is serving, and he asked that, "How do you up uh, upskill basically yourself yeah. while, while you're still in service and can't do a full time course?" Uh, today everything is online. Today you can do you. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of MOOCs. Today you can do a course from Yale sitting in Suratgarh. You can do a course from Harvard sitting in Suratgarh. 
so that is not a uh, that is not a challenge being in service you can't do a full time course yes but you can do the next best thing and uh, like i said executive programs are a good option especially for those who are posted in and around metros <coughs> one i posted on the group today the iift executive program it the classes are on weekends it is a one and a half year course the classes are on saturday sundays full time face to face so it's it's a option that is available to you and and it is one of the top 10 b schools in the country and okay, that is as far as management is concerned other is read uh youtube there is nothing that you can't learn by what uh, you can't learn by watching youtube i recently found a channel which teaches you how to repair a washing machine okay sir so, so now we'll move forward sir basically uh, i've done enough webinars as you know you are a part of our bulk subscription group yourself and so are uh, many of the audience in the audience today actually speaking i have been making an indication towards this whole idea of the gig gig economy taking over taking on it's increasing in a big way there is this like uh, bigger companies don't want to have too many people on their employee role and so on and so forth and this is where freelancers come into play and it gives them the freedom to do to or the voice is breaking at time so let's get going this way uh, tell us uh, okay so uh, if you can hear me now sir can yeah, you hear right. me now yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so uh, just for the uh, on the behalf of the audience if may i ask you that uh, not exact calculation but over a period of time of say last 11 years that you have been outside or 11 or 12 years so what's the average monthly that you were able to manage uh, with this kind of work profile and the kind of effort that you did just to give an idea not that uh, each guy will be ultimately having his own in case it's not too private to you too personal to you well i don't really care if you ask me manish uh, presently from uh, what i what i charge from ifc is 500 dollars a day right which includes part of the day so if i'm doing a 2 hour webinar it, uh, they pay me for the full day and they also the, the good part about the uh, 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 these international organizations is that they don't pay you just for the delivery but they pay you for the preparing time and the reporting time also so of course abhi to there's no traveling it's all online but when i was traveling so i the workshop was for four days i would get paid for eight days and the rate that i set uh, with them is my contract rate with them is 500 dollars a day and uh, so when i when i charge others for consulting like i'm full time with bird group i i understand that you know since it's a continuous thing and it's a this thing it can't be 500 so i've pegged it at about 60% of that and that is for the full time oh, okay so uh, th this is just to give people an idea that in corporate you get to work about 20 days in a month and if you work about 20 days a month so that's about Ten thousand rupees a day is generally supposed to be reasonably okay. That's what you should aim for. That's about two lakh a month, and anything above that, which is you in a different league altogether. Uh, fact of the matter is, uh, the second question that uh, again I would uh, like to ask you is, uh, while I understand that uh, starting on a parallel way of functioning, but I found the story very similar. Whether you are doing a regular job with a employee to one where you are responsible for your own self and where at one stage the employee seeks certain values uh, the, the, the your employer seeks certain values here you are taking it yourself uh, and showing it to the proverbial uh, guy who is going to take your consultancy so uh, tell me some of the values is like i i why i am bringing this question is i remember going back to the nda days where in lot of senior general officers would come and give us huge talks on integrity value system there is that and i would often wonder as to why is he telling us all this we know it pretty well enough it's only that the next 20 or 25 years revealed that well frankly not many of us know that now how important is this your belief convictions and value systems are to basically sell yourself as an independent freelancer 
thank you very that's a very good question and i think it is it is very important because like i said you have to deliver value right delivering value also means at times refusing an assignment like there have been instances where i have been offered an assignment i have analyzed that assignment and i have realized that look this is not my domain this is not my field it may have been a very highly paid assignment i could have maybe you know maybe i would have, i would have been able to deliver 80% or 70% of the value but i realized that i was not the right person for the job i went back to the client and i told them that boss this is i'm sorry but i'm not suited for this if you have something else whenever in future please come back to me it's not that i don't have the time or i don't i'm not available i'm not the best person for this so that is one part of it and invariably i have had return business from so that is one second is like i said doing more than you are paid for you know it's very easy for you to say ke ye ye mera kaam nahi hai but uh, making sure that uh, you know you you are delivering over and above what you uh, have been assigned to deliver and also you know it is also very important to make sure that the client knows that right and thirdly like i said under promise and over deliver so i one thing i am very been particular about is meeting deadlines and to ensure i meet deadlines i always give an optimistic deadline or rather a pessimistic deadline i would say so that i can over promise uh, under promise and over deliver if if a work takes me 5 days i will i will give a deadline of 7 8 days and you know i will not i will not say ke acha if the client says no 8 days is not okay for me Uh, I needed a five days. I'm so I then I tell them that I'm sorry, boss. I'm not. You know, I don't want to on the fifth day go back and tell them, "Yeah, I need two more days." That is something that I don't want to do. So those are some of the things that uh, also uh, conflict of interest. I have ensured that you know a full transparency and no conflict of interest. So when I was uh, when like when I started training for Franklin Covey, the, they had a. they had a standard contract which said that you know i undertake that i will not be training for any other this thing and all that and i think so uh, i there were a couple of other service officers who were there i spoke to them they said yaar they don't bother kar de sahi i i said i'm sorry i went back to the md and i told him that look i am training for this these two organizations these are international organizations but the nature of training is completely different there is no conflict of interest so i want this clause to be changed you include these two by name that okay i, I can continue to train for these two and no one else i'll not, i'll not take any other assignment he also appreciated it he told me he says you know i really appreciate that you've been transparent about this and similarly uh, when i i am presently i'm no longer training for franklin kavi because of my assignment to the bird group i went up to the, him and i told him that look i am going to be, i have joined this full time so therefore i will not be able to do your training however uh, you know i whatever are my current engagement i'm a contractual period i have taken a dispensation from them i will run through that whatever trainings you assign me within the next 3 months for that 3 month notice period i will do them and i want to keep a door open that tomorrow i leave bird group and then i want to you know come back and start delivering your trainings again he said sure any time door is open please so those are the values i feel that you know and these are some things which are inherent to us it's not something don't hide anything be very transparent uh, the other person will appreciate and will accommodate you okay. and second again is you know never right. compromise on your benchmark value like i said 500 dollars a day today i tell the client that look boss this is my thing if you say okay uh, i mean make a exception for me i'll make it this time maybe if it is like i said total value is more for me i'll make that exception but i'm making it for one time next time i'll Okay. okay so having uh, uh, come to know about this now let's uh, also get into the uh, basic uh, law of averages so you are a unique case uh, as many here would like to believe so but seeing from your angle and i also know that some people in the audience uh, personally i know them that they also are uh, capable of uh, authoring well they are capable of learning uh, of getting into lnd space themselves training and development themselves so 
how many percentage of people do you think on an average uh, amongst the veterans can go on your path many i really don't know how to answer that in terms of capability i would say 30 to 40% would be capable right in terms of opportunity is something that i can't answer um, I, and i'll okay one more thing which i thought i should add which i missed out on this thing was when i'm telling you this story 11 years down the line it sounds very rosy it sounds very smooth i think that good fortune and luck played a large part in my story i got the right breaks at the right time without you know uh, otherwise it could have well ended up with me going back to security domain and doing a 18 lakh job after 3 years it could well have ended that way. right so in terms of skills and capability i would say 30 to 40% would have the skills and capability to do this and opportunity is something is entirely on what you you know how lucky luck plays a very important like there was that saying by you know, when napoleon was appointing a general he is very brave he is very risky but tell me how lucky is he yeah true so glad that sir you sir, covered it up uh, because uh, being a slightly offbeat kind of a thing you, you, it still needs an effort uh, say let's put it this way if somebody wants to is, is into a regular job and still wants to pursue into some of these consulting assignments off and on so where does he search for on the net what are, what should he search for what should he look for manish do now pe kabhi nahi sawar hona chahiye theek hai because you do ho gaye aap if you are doing a full time job then do not look for consulting assignments is my sincere advice you will not be able to do justice to either however if you are looking at consulting assignments uh, <clears throat> like i said look at the websites of all these international bodies whether it is ifc whether it is world bank whether it is usaid then there is british aid there are these there is a german body like that all these international development agencies un asian development bank idbi uh, imf all these have they all all of them have a dedicated page on which they list their consulting assignments right again that's where luck comes in it is a matter of chicken and egg you know because all of them are hesitant to take you on for the first time unless you have relevant experience getting that first break is what is the difficult part once you are in it and once you start doing it it becomes easy also uh, there is a there is a website called dev uh, devnet development network devnet.com which has uh, which posts all these jobs for the international agencies which posts for the ngos like you know for example uh, like i i have been working with sherry blair foundation you have bill and melinda gates foundation you have whole lot of these four foundation so devnet jobs also is uh, another resource uh, uh, where they post these consulting assignments especially okay. uh, people who are you know with engineers and all that they can pick up Uh, they can easily pick up these people who have experience in mes and uh, you know project uh, uh, stick they can pick up uh, some of these construction assignments consulting assignments there okay sir so i am grateful that you again covered some of these aspects and now we probably come on to the last question uh, part of it you have done it once would you like to do it all over again certainly no regrets no comebacks again I, with the rider that i have the same luck <laughs> sure so guys uh, i think uh, we have uh, run out of all questions i tried to pitch in some of the things that which you would have liked to ask but were probably shy or otherwise not to ask and i think we covered the entire gamut right from the very basic to surreal to metaphysical in its own way Uh, my own understanding of all this is uh, when you are led by somebody you are actually or rather when you are working for somebody you are living somebody else's dream but when you are working on your own you are actually living your own dream and growing in your own way i'm quite convinced that uh, colonel rohit agarwal as he was 11 years back to what he is today 
is a much transformed and, and a much developed man than what he was, what he set out to. It's a great learning that he would have gone through self-learning and the very ease with which he spoke about the value systems and others, it tells me that it, it's, it's conviction, it's not convenience that makes him speak all those. So I'm grateful to you, sir, that you took time to share your views. And before we end, I'll give you the last word and last thoughts before we move on. Thanks, Manish. I think I just saw, saw another question pop up and with your permission, I'll take that. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. So the question is, what is the analogy of your L&D session in our current job? I'm sorry, I have not able to, I have not understood the question. I think what he, what he means is that uh, since we are also involved in learning and development and training, whether we are doing at the unit level, subunit level, class institutions and so on and so forth. So how equivalent is it to what is to be done outside probably that's what is it that is it right ankur you can say yes or no in your in the answer box if i have got your uh, question correct maybe sir uh, he will answer okay. but uh, let's take it as okay. a premise and uh, I, I i go by what you're saying yes so if you look at if you look at lnd uh, it's a cycle called ADDI. It's, it's abbreviated as ADDI, A-D-D-I-E. That is analysis, design, development, implementation, evaluation. So that is ADDI, A-D-D-I-E. Right. Now, when you look at the trainings that we impart, we are doing the I and E part. That is, we are doing the implementation part. And we are doing the evaluation part in uh, the training courses that if you are posted as an instructor or when you do the analysis, design, development, the PRESI or the course or the lesson plan has already been done and designed and developed. So you are not involved in that. And even in the evaluation, when you when you look at the uh, if you look at it from an LND perspective, the evaluation has four stages. One is, did they like it? Second is, did they learn it? Third is, did they apply it? And fourth is, did they gain from it? When we do the evaluation in the uh, learning and in the military training part of it, we do the first two stages. Did they like it? That is the feedback. And did they learn, which is the written assessment that we do. Did they apply it? We don't track it that, okay, now you did, you did, uh, you know, quartermaster course. What you learned, did you come back and did you apply it? That is not tracked. Did you gain from it? Again, that is not tracked. Whereas in the corporate, it is tracked because everyone wants to know whether there was a return on investment from training. So, uh, Ankur, I hope that answers your question. And if you want to go deeper, please, you can message me. And, uh, yeah, in fact, I'm... that goes for uh, all of you. And like Manish had just asked me to conclude, so I'll do that. Uh, firstly, thank you, Manish, for providing this immensely beneficial platform. And I wish that this was something like this was there uh, 11 years ago when you know I was leaving and went into it blind. Of course, there were a few uh, illustrious seniors who did guide me and who were there to partially, but it wasn't as extensive as what you know you are enabling now for people who are fortunate enough to that. So thank you very much. And uh, I'm sure you guys are deriving the value from that. Having said that, uh, Offer from my side, uh, gentlemen, you know now, uh, those of you who are here, uh, you know uh, my domain and my this thing. Please, I am on the group. You can take my this thing. Just message me. I am more than happy to reach out, uh, to extend any kind of, uh, you know, guidance, help, inputs that you may require. Right. And uh, I, I, am, I may not be able to give you a job or get help you get a job that's so i mean you must realize that expectation management and also that you know when you ask someone for something you should know what is what is within his or her capability what is not but guidance uh, certainly advice certainly uh, anytime please feel free to reach out it will be uh, i'll be very happy to help because i wish this kind of help was available to me when i was there. thank you manish Right. Thank you, sir. And uh, before we leave, uh, I think a food for thought for many here. Uh, guys, I have been uh, writing a lot on the group itself. Uh, we have been uh, giving uh, 
you know drawing inferences from the wuka world we are all going to be part of sooner than later we have also seen how the bigger corporates are losing out on their uh, profits they are shrinking and everyone is trying to cut the size so the future is going to be pretty uncertain and the kind of jobs that you see there was a report by forbes or someone that five years down the line for the 70% of the jobs that we see today are going not to be there so many of you who are coming out and who are looking only for jobs you will soon realize that maybe you might be employed at say 45 that you are coming out and the only thing worse that can happen to you is to get unemployed by say 52 or 55 so who are the people who are going to survive the people who are going to survive are those who are professionals in their own right people who have their own know how people who have their own world view people who are capable of expressing the same bringing out the change and part of the changing world phenomena as it exists so that's all part of change management because as i was talking to somebody else as we all uh, most xndas will recall that judging distance in classes in nda was learned by the system of usha ki bra and that usha ki bra has seen us most of us for almost 30 33 odd years in private sector unfortunately in the competitive world usha ki bra is not going to last beyond 2 years so let's have new way of skills going about new learning for our own selves this whole channel that is there like there are hundreds of people about 1500 of this on the retire group they get damn happy only by reading some of those sweet nothings that we put on the uh, on the telegram group and in text but actually greater learning will happen through these webinars and subsequently through the focused classes that we do so my aim is now to make this channel move to a different level of learning and development for the forgies and ultimately from learning and development to delivering of value we will be soon be coming out with our own website so that we start becoming revenue generators by the forgies for the forgies with help of forgies for always for the forgies so thank you so much guys uh, thank you rohit sir Uh, good night to each one of you. Shabbat khair. Thanks, Minister. Bye bye.